we think they're better engaged, not only with their teachers and with their academics, but also with each other, which now highlights the importance of how we look at our social emotional learning and our mental health. I think removing that piece has allowed them some freedom to be able to say, let me focus. I don't have to worry about what's on TikTok. I don't have to worry about what's going on at home. Let me focus and do my job here at school. And then once that's done, this is available to me. You're listening to the smartsocial.com podcast. I'm your host, Josh Oaks. This is our district talk segment where we interview district leaders to learn how they're keeping students safe on social media so those students can someday shine online. Now, let's get back to the interview. Hi, my name is Melvin Brennan. I'm superintendent of Montgomery Public Schools in Montgomery, Alabama. We're a district of about 25,500 kids that are spread across 50 buildings. Some capacity situations in our buildings means we should probably have some fewer buildings, and that'll be a discussion for later. Superintendent, it's so great to have you here today. Thank you so much for joining us on the smartsocial.com podcast. We interview a lot of superintendents and district leaders just like yourself with one goal in mind. How can we take the things that you're really good at and share it with other district leaders nationwide so that we're all in this together to build the most resilient students ever so that when they're 25, they have a great career, great education, and an understanding of how to navigate the world. So I'm thankful that you're here today. The superintendent, I'd like to dive into our first question. What's your biggest accomplishment as a district over the past one to four years? I'm going into year three here at Montgomery. And uh, just to give context, we've had an historically under-resourced uh, school district for 30 plus years. I think our biggest accomplishment that we recently took care of was in this past uh, spring when we had a ballot initiative passed that allowed us to continue to receive some of the funds we've been receiving over 30 years. Many of our districts across Alabama, uh, renewals are not being approved by communities, and we were fortunate to have that done, which allows us to do the academic work in classrooms. Every community, it seems like, is very different, whether it's the funding difficulties, parent engagement difficulties. So I appreciate the insight. Now, Superintendent, what advice do you have for other school districts to deal with possible social media issues that could originate on social media apps, but then they create a very real problem on campus? They do. I, I think it's important that we, one, work with kids to make them understand the proper usage in some ways. And this can't be explicitly taught all in, in, in courses or anything like that. But we have to make kids understand the utility of how they use social media platforms and, and the long-term implications. It's easy to put something out there today and not necessarily have any backlash, but that's going to be there forever. And someone is going to find it. And you might find yourself in a position where you can't do something down the road because of something you did. Uh, what we try to do to mitigate some of that is to, we have some monitoring situations that kind of give us a heads up when a particular school is targeted or a particular area and things of that nature that allow us to respond. We have a really good uh, security team that understands what those implications look like and they go out to those homes and meet with kids and parents to make sure those issues don't come back to school. Uh, we also are very connected in the community. We have some really good contacts, be they students or adults, who give, a, give us heads up on things that we may or may not know that allow us to alleviate some of those situations before they happen. Yeah, those are all great approaches. And you really said something that I think is powerful nationwide. The thing that you said that was so, so powerful is if students post this now thinking they're funny or whatever, or in the moment, we've all been there as kids, but now it will impact them when they're trying to get into their dream college, vocation, internship, or anywhere else. Oh no, that lives with me forever. I want to double click on that question because I think superintendent, I think you're really hitting on something really powerful. Right. What is your tip for students or parents on what should they say to themselves before they post to make sure that what they're posting they're proud of in the future? One, I think parents have to, to, to have a good understanding of social media platforms themselves so they can actually have those conversations at home. They have to be aware uh, of what's there and how it's being used. Uh, in terms of what you might post, I would say to someone, okay, if you don't want to see this on the front page of our newspaper or splattered all over CNN on the crawl or uh, somewhere on another news channel where the public can consume it in a large way, very readily and easily, then you probably shouldn't post it. I think we're in a, in a place where we think simply because it's on Twitter or it's on, excuse me, maybe I should say X. If we put it on Facebook or what have you, only the people there are going to see it. The people there are going to see it and they're going to share it with other people and other people are going to find it. At some point, someone is going to search your name because they're interested in hiring you or admitting you to college or putting you in a program or getting you a scholarship. And they're going to find that information that's going to preclude them in some ways of actually having you get access to that. And that's basically shooting yourself in the foot. 
Yeah, so well said. Now, here's my next question for you, sir. Can you provide some examples of how your students may have used their social media in a positive or productive way that may have benefited themselves or their community or maybe even the school district? Yeah, I think the one thing our kids do with social media here, uh, I saw a little bit of this in my previous district, but here they're really good about getting on social media and promoting their schools and promoting programs, sports activities, support for each other on social media, which was a bit unique for me to see. I haven't seen that often. I didn't really expect it. I'm really excited about the fact that they recognize the greatness in each other and they're more than willing to put it out there and share it. Uh, and they are the irresponsible with it as well. Sure they are with their kids. They're going to make those types of mistakes. My biggest concern is that they don't make mistakes that are going to be life altering or life changing on social media. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you create a barrier or a wall that prevents you from getting somewhere you want to go. And I like how you said also highlighting each other's excellence or, or what makes them awesome. It's such a good sign. So the, the next question is a little bit of an overlap of what we've already talked about, but I'd love to hear from you. What suggestions do you have for parents to encourage their kids to use technology in a positive way, both in the classroom and at home? I think if we're wise about how we use technology, it opens up a world that many of us can't imagine. And if we, we're thoughtful about how to use it and we use it in a way that's purposeful, it will open up those avenues for us. So our conversations are about, sure, engage in technology, engage in the use of AI, uh, but make sure we're using it responsibly. I'll just use um, chat GPT as just one example. Districts like mine, typically tools of that nature are kept from kids and we're telling them, no, you can't do this. I believe we have to give kids access to those programs and those opportunities and teach them the best ways to use them. Otherwise we'll create equity issues for them post high school. We're supposed to be about diminishing equity issues, not creating brand new ones. So I think we have to give them access, but we have to teach them the proper way of doing it. I saw a, a, a lesson with a teacher who used an AI lesson and basically the kids had to argue a point with ChatGPT. And it was a great lesson where they learned how to use the tool effectively, understood the flaws that could exist and still were able to convey their own arguments with their own voices. I love that. I like what you just said. If we keep students away from these tools, they won't know who else is going to teach them. Right. They're in a safe spot right now to learn this with the trusted adults in their life, the teachers and the administrators. I love. Yeah, and there are some kids around the country that are going to have access. And my job is to make sure my kids can compete with those kids. Keeping those opportunities away from them spreads the, the, the gaps that already exist. And we're not competing with kids down the street. We're competing with kids across the country. And across the world. quite frankly, worldwide. Yep. Right? but especially across the country. It's very easy to understand that, yeah. Okay, so my next question for you is, what are your suggestions for other school districts to increase parent engagement? And there's a follow-up question in it. Are there any specific channels that you're finding in your district or maybe events that get the biggest turnout? I think that's some place that we as educators have to grow. All of us went to school, all of us are familiar with the PTA meetings and the school plays and things of that nature. And I think we've tried to continue to replicate that model I think it has to look different. We have to create programming that interests opportunities for parents and take those opportunities to parents in spaces where they're more comfortable. Unfortunately, there's a generation of parents who may have had a bad experience themselves when they were in schools. So they assume that their kid's going to have the same experience. Our job is to change that mentality. And uh, I think it's important that we take things out into the community and how we partner in that way, I think increases their ability to be able to attend. Work schedules are very different now than they were 30 years ago. We have to be respectful of that. Not every parent can just roll up to the PTA meeting at five o'clock in the afternoon. They're working a second job, but we have, we have to look at those challenges and create new ways to do it. Are we recording our offerings so that parents can watch them and consume them on their own time? That's something else that needs to happen. But I wanna engage parents in, in a way to be purposeful, that they understand they have a purpose in terms of what we do and that they're able to become models for kids. Part of what we want to do with some of our work this year is to really ramp up literacy and what that looks like, not only in our school district, but in the community. So the adults are starting to read more, which would entice kids to read more. Kids are going to do what they see. If they see that the adults are being very serious and, and purposeful about literacy, they will do the same thing. So that's something that we are trying to, to lift up, all, up off the ground this year. Very well said on all points. What are your thoughts around some districts that are going cell phone free in the classroom to lower distractions and improve learning and student development? We, we happen to be one of those districts. So we finished the implementation of that initiative last year. 
Uh, it was very successful in my opinion. For one, I think there, there was the excuse that kids need access to a device in order to uh, use them for class or what have you. We're a one-to-one -one district, so they already had that access. Uh, so the cell phones are necessary. What we found is that cell phones were adding to distractions, not only in the classroom, but outside of the classroom as kids would plan uh, activities that were not necessarily uh, conducive to school environments that would happen in hallways and bathrooms and things of that nature. And they were able to coordinate on those phones. Uh, so we put that in initiative in place last year and we saw our discipline drop about 20%. We saw improved student engagement. We saw better opportunities for kids to actually have discussions with their teachers. And now our teachers aren't actually having to fight with kids about cell phones because we've had a policy in place for four that they can't use them in, in school. But teachers have to fight with kids in order to say, you can't use your cell phone, put that away. I don't want my teachers having to do that. I want them to be able to teach in an environment that is conducive to learning. And I think uh, there'll be some to say they want, their parents will want their kids to have their phones in an emergency. Perhaps you might. However, I can assure you this, if they're distracted by what's on the phone, they're not listening to the adults in the building, directing them any of an, emer of an emergency. And there are tons of calls going out of that building that are going to complicate how first responders come into the, 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 the vicinity to address whatever that situation might be. Uh, our police department says to us they would rather get one call than 350 calls. So well said. Superintendent, what has been the current solution? Is it putting in a locker? Is it one of those home things as the kids walk in? Or do you have Faraday bags? Like, What's the solution right now to go cell phone free in your district? We have pouches. Um, they have, kids have to lock up their phones in those pouches every day as they come in the building. There are a number of magnets throughout the building that can allow them to open those and they don't get access to them until the end of the day in which they can come through and then reopen their bags. And their phones are right there for them. They keep their phones all day long. They just can't access them. Now, of course, our some of our kids are creative and find ways to get around it. And we have to address those issues. Uh, but I've always believed you don't get 100% of anything. I think it's mitigated a lot of issues that we had to confront in my first year here. We didn't have those same issues in year two. This is such a fascinating discussion, Superintendent. And I really admire you leaning in saying, we're going to create this safe haven for learning and focus. That's really what I think is happening here. But also, I want to get your feedback because you talk with your principals all the time. Um, we've heard from some principals, boy, the first week it was terrible, and now kids are actually looking forward. I've heard, please mm -hmm. please correct me if I'm wrong, kids are actually socializing at, at lunch now at the cafeteria. They're actually the talking with others because they realize this device was added sugar that they needed to be taken away for a short period. Absolutely. Give me some insights. What are your principals, your amazing boots on the ground that we adore and love? What are they saying about this transition? What did the first 30, 60, 90 days look like? Yeah, I think the first implementation was a little rough because something new, it takes time, people time to adjust to it regardless. Timing and getting into the building and things of that nature as everyone you know, put their phones away. Uh, but just that same thing happened. Kids began to talk to each other in cafeterias, in hallways, in common spaces. And now we think they're better engaged not only with their teachers and with their academics, but also with each other, which now highlights the importance of how we look at our social emotional learning and our mental health. I think removing that piece has allowed them some freedom to be able to say, let me focus. I don't have to worry about what's on TikTok. I don't have to worry about what's going on at home. Let me focus and do my job here at school. And then once that's done, this is available to me. It's funny. I thought we would get a lot more pushback than we did. I'm thankful that we didn't, but I think people understand the utility of it. We as adults need that break as well. And honestly, I wish someone would take my socks. <laughs> I feel the same. We've heard some other superintendents and principals the kids are actually secretly begging for us to say, here's some boundaries. We want you to put this away in this little cage or whatever you want to call it. Even my sister has a, an amazing pet, the cutest dog in the whole world. The, kid, the pet actually looks forward once we built a crate for it to sleep in there. It had less anxiety. It's like, no, I know where my little place is. And every, everything went better. The dog's happier. Everybody's happier with a little bit of boundaries. And I, I do think that these devices are the most wonderful thing in the world, mm -hmm. but I love that you've put boundaries on them so kids can learn to manage their day, their access. Absolutely wonderful. What would you tell other district leaders such as yourself nationwide? Because you really are spearheading this. I'm really impressed. What would you tell them if they're on the fence about this? Well, I think it's, it's our job as adults to create boundaries for kids. Kids are always going to like what we do. I didn't always like what my mom had me do, but it was for a, the betterment of what was going to happen in the long term. We have to do things that are uncomfortable sometimes, and we aim to be comfortable with discomfort because it allows us to grow. 
And sometimes we're going to just, we're just going to have to do some things we don't like. And ultimately I would say, given your community, I would certainly say, get your support from your community about how that looks. It's, it will look at different in different places, depending on your clientele, depending on your parent engagement. Here, we focused on how this was going to have an impact on safety and improve student achievement as far as our conversation. And when we said that to our parents, like most, most of them understood that, yeah, that these were not necessarily safe spaces that we need to make safe. I think in some places where people assume that the spaces are already safe, your conversations may look a little different. We were pretty quick in our implementation. I don't think you can be that quick in every community. Being purposeful about who you bring in the room, how you give the information, how you have that conversation, what research you have to back up to what you're doing. If you notice in this venue, we've had a ton of research come out in the past few months. We were privy to that way back last July and August when we were implementing. So I would encourage them to use all that information to their advantage in having those conversations. Absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. The next question I have for you is an interesting one. We want students to feel equipped engaged and really understand themselves when they discover themselves, then they can discover their future. I would argue, are there any personality tests or plans or systems or programs, or maybe curriculums that your school sites, school buildings are using in middle school and high school students to find their why, to find their strengths, to find their purpose and help them navigate their future? There have been a number of tools out there for a number of years in regard to inventories that allow kids to get and feel for what they think they want to do. My own experience, it seems as though sometimes kids answer those inventories the way we, they think we want them to, not necessarily how they feel. So what we're trying to create are pathways in middle school or high school that allow kids to explore all the opportunities that might exist so they can pick and choose what they're interested in, what they're not interested in, and they can make those good long-term solutions. My goal is always to expose kids to things that they like and let them experience them, but also expose them to things they don't like. So they know exactly why they don't like it, or perhaps you actually do like it and you haven't thought about it enough. And then unpacking what some of those industries look like. If someone wants to express that they want to be a doctor, okay, how do we unpack what working in a hospital looks like? You don't have to be a surgeon. You don't have to be a nurse. There's an HR department. There's a communications department. All these things are in a hospital. So you can still work in that environment and not necessarily be the guy or a girl going into the operating room with the scout to operate. So I think it's important that we expose them to all those things to help them make those decisions. Uh, but again, as I said earlier, they can't be what they can't see. They've got to be able to see those opportunities and make some decisions about whether or not they see themselves in that. And so from a pathway perspective, that's what we're trying to create. Superintendent, this is great. We're about to dive into our final question for you, which is the hottest question everybody's talking about. It talks about AI. Before we do that, I want to pause the program for a quick second, give a shout out to the incredible smartsocial.com team who's creating 54 plus live events for school districts around the country who are using our live parent night events to engage parents in English and Espanol and Mandarin and 12 other languages to give them just what they need in about 30 minutes and answer all their questions 54 times a year. School districts used to do one uh, back to school digital safety night. Now we're covering dozens and dozens of topics all year long with 10 times the psychologists, 10 times the students in the program. We have 30 plus teens teaching the program. A really incredible shout out to the team and all the social media resources they're giving to our school district partners. We're grateful for all the great work and to all of our partners. All right, we're back to the program here now. And uh, Superintendent, I wanna ask you the hottest question on everybody's mind is how is your school district approaching AI tools, ChatGPT, Google's Gemini and Claude? You know, I think we're being cautious because we're still learning ourselves as the adults, but ultimately we can't deprive our students of those, of those tools because we create long-term equity issues for them where we know other kids in other districts will have access. So you've got to teach them the most appropriate ways to use them. Uh, I gave an example before when we talked about Chad GPT and a teacher actually used that tool to have kids argue with Chad GPT to, to debate a point. Yeah. And then share that with the rest of the class. And what a great opportunity for them to understand what it can do, what it can't do, what the, the shortfalls might be. Because if you can't just, you can't just randomly put something in chat GPT, cut and paste it into a Word doc and say, oh, here, I'm done. You've got to look at that to make sure it's accurate. You've got to make sure the context is right. And we want to help students develop their own voice. If, that, if a tool like that can kickstart a kid in developing his or her voice, that's a great tool, but let's make sure we add your voice, how you sound 
insane is information? How accurate is it when you are conveying it? So I want to be able to grow in that space myself. So that I can have better conversations with our staff, and getting them to understand the importance of making sure our kids have that context as well. Excellent. I love the approach. I couldn't be more proud of what your district's doing. I think it's terrific. Superintendent, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you. Thank you. All right. To everybody else who's watching, whether you're a district leader, principal, or even some of our favorite, the counselors and the teachers, the boots on the ground who we love and adore, we're grateful for you. Remember to help your kids be safe on social media so they can someday shine online. We're smartsocial.com. And also one last thing, make sure whenever you're posting online to our staff, our parents, and everybody else, that you keep it light, bright, and polite because our kids are watching. Have a great rest of the day. We'll see all of you on the next episode. Take care. Thanks for listening to our smartsocial.com podcast. I'm your host, Josh Oaks. This was our district talk segment where we interview school district leaders to learn how they're keeping students safe on social media so those students can someday launch into their future by shining online. This episode was brought to you by our smartsocial.com VIP program. It's called the Very Informed Parent Program, which helps you engage your students with teen-led video lessons. Stay one step ahead with our premium parent newsletter and discover hidden features on trending apps on teens' phones and our 54 plus live parent and student-friendly events every single year. You can click on the link below to chat with one of our team members if you want a free pass to our VIP program to support your community with our smartsocial.com resources. And if you're a district leader who has a success story, we would love to feature you on a future episode. You can click the links below to reach out. Thanks so much for listening, and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Have a great day.